patient perspective, and then discussion from the audience and questions for them. So again, from that prospective study, we'll, so we'll start off talking about quality of life and how kyphosis can affect uh, one's quality of life. And um, so we've done some research, and I showed this slide earlier. Again, it, there's an impact on self-image, pain, activity. These are the domains of the Scoliosis Research Society. And, you know, mental health, how one feels about uh, one's condition and self, and sort of there are uh, aspects of that that may affect one's mental health. So, uh, and it's more so than for uh, scoliosis, adolescent scoliosis, and, um, and certainly compared to healthy adolescents that don't have a spinal condition. And when we look at, the, remember the different apex, apices, we have the thoracic apex higher up or the thoracolumbar, which is the lower apex. And when you have a patient with a, a thoracolumbar, the lower apex on the right, they tend to have more pain. And that's what, our, that's what our research showed, the lower apex is more painful. And then when we look at the, the patients following them through uh, surgery, so we had less patients who had both the preoperative questionnaire filled out and the post, and we've published this recently, nearly 60 patients uh, for Schreierman's kyphosis that underwent surgery, and over 500 for adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. We can see improvements in both groups, so the Schreierman's patients are in uh, blue, the scoliosis patients are in red, and you can see there are bigger changes, so if just, if you look at, for example, self-image, you know, some patients really didn't like the way their, they appeared, their back appearance was, but it improved dramatically. And for pain and function and mental health as well. So it's really, we, it's a good operation in that patients feel that these areas improve significantly. And it met the MCID, which is what is most important clinically, and the minimal clinically important. So the minimum amount of change that is meaningful to the patient was met in these areas so that I just showed. And here's an example. Um, we, some of the patients tend to be a little overweight and we, we saw that in, in our data. Um, and, and so, you know, some of us are a little overweight, we just have to work at it. And so uh, it's something that is worth counseling our patients about. And the preoperative scores Five is the best score, one is the lowest score. Just keep it simple. If you just look at the mean on the right, the score improves from almost three to four and a half. So patients did well. This is a pain score, so the higher the number, the, the more the pain went from eight to zero at two year follow up in this particular patient. So pain gets better and the various domains get better. And two more slides. This shows that only the most severe curves cause. Um, uh, decline in lung function. So moderate or severe impairment is in red. So patients having a, a decreased lung function is in red, and you can see for curves over 90 degrees, more patients experience a decrease in their lung function. And with surgery, we see an improvement. So the vast majority, or the three that had severe impairment, and for whom we had before and after uh, lung function testing, we found that those largely improved. One patient did not come back fully, but uh, so surgery can improve that. Okay, so let's bring up now Jody uh, Boyington, who has kyphosis. Jody, please sit in one of those chairs. I'll bring up the mics in a second. Uh, Abigail Katima here. Abigail, come on up. And of course, none other than Peter Janunis. Peter, come on down. Great. I'm going to stay up here for now. Um, we'll give you one of these. So, uh, Jody, why don't you actually why don't you uh, speak from where you are? Alrighty. I feel a lot easier that way. Stand up if you'd like, or sit, whatever's most comfortable for you. Why you know you what? I think story? I'll probably stand for this. <laughs> um, you know, well, first I'd like to thank you guys, all of you, uh, Mr. Strott and Setting Scoliosis Straight for having me here. Um, you know, I was very worried that giving this talk and sharing my personal story would uh, kind of sound like a pity party. And so I wrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it a thousand times and none of it just sounded right. So instead I decided to do what I always do and just give the blunt honest truth and I'll try to keep it family friendly. 
Um, you know, first impressions are you know paramount in any interaction, uh, be it home, work, or you know friends. So when you approach somebody while being slouched or hunched, they tend to think of you as depressive. They tend to think of uh, you know you as negative, and that's just frustrating beyond belief. Um, other people's perceptions tend to color and paint your own thoughts, feelings, and uh, self-doubts, leading to a self-feeding cycle of insecurity. The additional physical pain then serves as a constant reminder in your mind that you are, quote-unquote, not normal. But what is normal, anyway? You know, I've tried to live my life by embracing the strange, you know, and having it become a part of me. You know, I've worked hard despite and in spite of the terrific pain that I've felt ever since I was 17 years old. You know, and it's only gotten worse over the years. I mean, I was diagnosed at 17 with a 70 some odd degree curvature, and it's about 90 now. Um, and I certainly think that alongside scoliosis screening, we should have kyphosis screening as well in schools. You know, because I think that had it been found earlier, my life would have been considerably different. You know, I tried to go for surgery a couple of times and uh, once at Thomas Jefferson University in Philadelphia, and another time at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. And they ended up kind of pushing me off to the side because I couldn't afford the other 20% that Medicare wouldn't cover. That was also before the Affordable Care Act, so maybe that's different these days. Um, and as far as day-to-day -day impact, I mean chronic pain, especially spine pain, makes it difficult to function in an energetic, positive manner at work or home. You know, if you decide not to carry much of a social life where you relegate it to online interactions, as the mere thought of going out can sometimes be draining. But trying to raise a child and care for a family becomes almost impossible at times. I cannot begin to tell you the heartbreak of your child raising his arms to be picked up and you are physically unable to do so. Or having to explain to a prospective significant other that you are uncertain what is going to happen in the future in regards to your health, only knowing that it will not be pleasant for either party involved. To have knowledge and training to do a complex, well-paying job, which in my case was machining and, you know, machinists, and because of the physical demands of that job, am unable to do so, or even be looked over and, you know, with the thought that you're not going to be able to give 100%. You know, and because of the pain, because of the worry, I've taken many, many low-paying jobs over the years simply to work, and I've sacrificed and lost out on so much of my child's lives because of those limitations. But I've still had to work harder in other areas of my life. I've had to teach myself how to fix my car because I couldn't afford a mechanic, and I'm actually quite proud of my 1989 Oldsmobile. <laughs> you know, and I did have a rant about the comfort of modern cars here, and I just, in the interest of time, I got rid of that. Um, this curvature has made my even day-to-day -day existence tricky. I found that my bladder has two modes, absolutely fine or exceedingly urgent. I seem to have constant sciatica, and it feels like I'm walking through mud most of the time. You know, I have nerve delay and uh, two fingers on each side of my arms, and uh, it's made uh, it difficult to pursue music which was a long-standing passion of mine. Kind of hard to play a guitar or piano when your fingers don't move the way you want them to. And if it seems like I'm complaining, I'm, I'm really not. It's just my reality. And I've long accepted that it's a part of my life. You know, I'm here today to relate it in hopes that, you know, people will take, in their, take their kids in, have them screen, because living like this is not a good or pleasant life for anyone. Oddly enough, I can tell you the good impacts it's had on me. It's made me strong. Stronger than most people realize. It's made me more understanding. It's given me a greater appreciation for the little things in life. You know, watching the rain collect on my windshield in the middle of the night. Well-cooked meal by my own hand, or a good song, pretty sunset, or, you know, a well-timed joke. Without the pain, without the trials and tribulations, I wouldn't be sitting here or standing here to share all this. And just thank you all for listening. I, uh, if you have any questions, I'm very open, but just speak up, because I'm happy to have them both ears. Sure. Cheers. Thank you so much. That was very compelling and uh, heartfelt, and you, you live it every day. So thanks for those words. Now, we'd love to hear from Abigail if you'd like to yeah, speak to some of your feelings and thoughts. <laughs> so I can't hear you. I'm not going to get up, but I'll speak really loud for you all. Um, so my name's Abigail, but everyone calls me Abby. I'm a current student of public health at St. Louis University, where I'm actually from. 
Um, so I actually got diagnosed when I was 11 years old during the dreaded years of puberty, as like most parents like to call it. Um, my family moved from St. Louis, Missouri to the DC metro area, and it was a very troubling time for us because um, at that time, we didn't know what kyphosis was. We never knew what the disease uh, was about. We didn't really know much about um, scoliosis either. So just to get diagnosed was a very hard situation. I remember walking into my specialist and seeing a lot of people with um, cerebral palsy and just feeling out of place because I was walking, talking, and breathing just fine. But what most people didn't realize was I have I had an 85 degree curvature, um, which right now you can't really see because it's gotten much better over the years um, by itself. But the only form of treatment I actually ever got was six months of physical therapy and just one x-ray. And that was at the age of 11. Now today I'm 24 and that's the only form of treatment I have ever seen. And I have tried to talk to um, many doctors over the years to try to get some form of treatment plan, but uh, no one really knows what to do with me. So we're still working on it. <laughs> and we're still fighting for it um, every day. But um, it's really interesting because when I went to my primary care physician, um, they just didn't know what to do. And then when I went abroad to try to get some treatment in Africa, they thought I had tuberculosis. But I work in healthcare, so they thought it was PONS. So they tried to also misdiagnose me that way. And the only thing they ever told me to this day was, you should probably go outside and walk, or you should probably go play and have a great childhood. Wow. And that was it. And I've been told many times that I find many um, physicians and nurses and um, other personnel, like, just to say, this was your choice, and you told your bones to hunch over. Now, we all know that's not correct. We all know that this is faulty DNA, and it's something genetic. Um, no one in my family actually has it. I'm the only one. So they were trying to see if my brother had it, but he um, doesn't, which is, which is amazing. But um, when people first meet me, they just don't know what to do. They just see this tiny person with a big bubbly personality. And it's just like, what? You have some sort of chronic disease? Is that actually a thing? Um, I still have my curves. They're just hidden pretty well right now. Um, but it does make me super, super tired. Like, I just, in my lumbar spine, I just feel like gravity just sits there. And gravity is such a pain. Um, just because I'm in school, so eight hours a day, you know, you're sitting in those tough chairs. You don't know what to do. You want to study. But, I mean, you just got to walk around. You just got to take breaks. You have to know where your limits lie. Because at the end of the day, it's you and your body. Don't let anyone tell you that um, that you did this to yourself or that it was a choice. Because it's, it's not. Um, but you just need to know where your limits lie and to understand that it's chronic, it's not up to you, but just know that taking breaks is okay at the end of the day. Abigail, thanks so much. You're very articulate and poised and well spoken. Mom should be proud. Uh, and your mom should be proud too, Joe. She's sadly not with us. No, I'm sorry. So we've got Peter now whose mom is probably also proud. Let's hear what you have to say, Peter, who's undergoing treatment right now. With Dr. Hey. Sponseller, right? Yeah. Okay, go on. Hey, I'm Peter. I have Schuerman's kyphosis. And the way we found that out is I was with my mom, and we were on the top of this mountain trying to take a picture. And she would say, like, Peter, you're hunching over, and you look bad in the picture. Try to stand up straighter. <laughs> Never I could stand up straighter, my belly would kill out. And she's like, pull your belly in, too. And so <laughs> we realized there was probably some kind of a problem if I can't stand up with my belly not sticking out. So we went in and I found out that I had like 70 degrees of curvature. So that's like up there, that's pretty, pretty high. And surgery was thrown out as an option, but I really don't want surgery. I'd prefer to not have like some kind of permanent thing. So I picked this Milwaukee brace, this giant constricting thing and I I've stuck with that for like three years now and it's gotten me down to 39 degrees so it's like it's it's really just wearing this 23 hours a day I I'm, I've started weaning off of it now I'm down to just nighttime uh, and then physical therapy was the other thing where as an apathetic teenager I'm sitting there saying like there's no way lying on my back and breathing is going to help me like with this curving in my spine but it turns out that's like the best thing there was. 
was just lying down and breathing, it like forces your spine to extend in a way that like I don't know, back then I didn't know like what muscles to actually use to get in that position and the breathing kind of like teaches you how to extend your back and then the brace just helps me keep it that way when I can't be actively thinking about how I'm sitting. So Peter, I, I just would disagree with one thing you said. You're not apathetic. <laughs> Did you have anything else you wanted to add to? to yeah, that's really it. It's great, and uh, thanks for sharing that. So, so, you know, unfortunately, these sessions are so tight and short. But you know, I think you've heard perspectives, and I think you made a choice, right, yeah. for your body. And uh, there are other choices. They may be uh, surgical, and it's not for everybody. Yeah, and I no, think it's, it's definitely a valid option, though. Like if, like. If you have a severe spinal curve, surgery is like a great solution if you don't want to do the bracing or if the bracing isn't going to work. I but just, it didn't seem like something I wanted to do, so I gave the bracing a shot. Well, I congratulate you for your perseverance and persistence and excellent results so far. So we're going to, unfortunately, have to move to the next session and we'll make up some time because we have uh, less speakers. And then I promise we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers if we stay on time. So Dr. Wong is going to come on up and Clay Miller as well will play, take part. So Steve, you can start here. Yeah. And then Clay, why don't the speakers from now sit down and Clay, you'll come on up. And Dr. Wong, there we go. You have a slider. Okay, good. <laughs> so, so this session just tips on quick recovery. So Clay can tell us a little bit more about that, but we'll skip any slides. You know, Dr. Sponsel had talked a little bit earlier about how we've reduced their length of stay in the hospital, and that's through a lot of different you know, research on how to improve, reduce pain, and help you know, people recover a little quicker from the surgery and hopefully get home faster. And certainly the algorithm has changed a little bit, where instead of staying in bed for days after surgery, we, like we talked about earlier, that we try to get you know, people recovering faster so that even the day of or the day after surgery, they work with a physical therapist and up and about. Uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit from Clay's perspective and you know, we can touch base with other people as well, see what they've been through, and then I'll come sit over next to you. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so basically I was diagnosed with it as 85 degrees at first, and I heard about surgery and I was like, no, I'm not doing surgery. So I went six months for the um, post-op. I had no back pain and I considered surgery not an option. But then once we got to the six months later, I basically, my back started hurting and it got over 100 degrees and I was like, I have to do surgery now. Did your tummy stick it out too? Yeah. Yeah. I don't have to stand up straight. And yeah, basically every day, um, people would say like, why are you slouching? And I physically could not stop slouching. So it was just the way it is. So I had surgery and it was probably the best thing I could do. Um, I grew like four inches in the process. Um, but it was T5 to L2 and um, it was about a week of intense pain after the surgery, but after that, um, it got better each day, and after two months, I was pretty much as good as I was before. So, or back to better. I mean, yeah. Um, so how how long before you got back to? You know, I guess you played spike ball and everything, but kind of activity with um, your friends. I would say six months. Six months. Six months yeah. Yeah. Home seller wanted about six yeah. months. Yeah. Yeah. Before bending a lot. <laughs> but, but he was back at school. I was back at school after two months. So. And do you feel anything during your hospital stay in the recovery at home? Was there anything that helped you in particular? Or do you feel like... Um, I'd say definitely push walking. Like, don't just sit there, don't like lay down. Definitely try to get up and move. Because the more you move, the better you get. And the Way Xbox faster. is very tempting. <laughs> yeah. So definitely. Mom and Nana had to get after him to get up. And <laughs> is that a reward based thing after 20 minutes? No, he wanted to be on the Xbox all the time. So I would <laughs> probably did it the wrong way. Yeah. But I didn't have anybody to talk. And then I joined the... Um, the Shermans, there's um, the Facebook site too to, to help to talk to different people that are going through it. That's great. So it was neat to join that. I was having a discussion with my uh, moms, the patients I have, and we're talking about social media and how obviously it's changing the way you practice medicine. Does that help you in any way? Do you feel like connecting to your friends, classmates? I 
I didn't really know much about it at all until after I had the surgery. My mom kind of joined the Facebook group. We joined group, it afterwards and then when I show them. I'm learning a lot more about it now than I had no idea what it was we when I first found out about it. Better, sure. Just yeah. pre-surgery. I have a lot of but, questions, so it's nice yeah. to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with yeah, kids' yeah, own age. Yeah. It's definitely good that people are now like doing a lot more with it. Like, I, I, I wanted to say one thing. I would love the, we were kind of the gray area prior to his going with our pediatrician because it was probably 70 degrees when he was 15 years old and she had said either PT or just do core strength. She said he'll grow out of it, it's just um, postural kyphosis. And I would just love, I, and when my pediatrician, yeah, I don't think she's here. <laughs> I would just love for more pediatric, my, you know, pediatric, the whole center, for them to have sent us to Sponsell, you know, she sent us directly to Sponsell, and then we had some other um, children's hospital and some others that didn't want to do surgery on it. Um, but Sponsell, you know, was right there and said he could fix it for us. But it was very frustrating, especially 85 degrees, you know, the bigger curvature, you really over 100 degrees. You have, to, in, in our world, we had to do the surgery for his future because he was only 16, 17. But I really wish that um, pediatricians, I come from a medical family, and we were both like, why did pediatricians send us to these specialists? And I hear that. I'm so frustrated. I hear. I'm sure that's common all over the country and all yeah. over the world. The pediatricians are the front <coughs> lines, and yeah. they uh, do screening, and right. they are trained to do screening for scoliosis, mm -hmm. and they see postural round back all day long. So for them, first of all, it's not as common to have short right. as it is, although the numbers seem to suggest they are, but it's really not as common and they're not trained for it, and a lot of times it falls through the cracks of mm -hmm. maybe this is just postural. So I see that very frequently. And I think it comes down to a matter of education, and we have a duty to educate the pediatricians, mm -hmm. and in those states that have school screening, I think uh, somebody mentioned. Yeah, to add it. To add Jody the mentioned, yeah. Yeah. we should have school screening for this as well. Yeah. So I think unless there are any other compelling statements, let's move on to the next uh, area. That was great. Thanks for sharing. So we're going to bring up Matt Ajin. Ajin, I got it right this time. My esteemed colleague who is in D.C. at the National Children's National. Children's National. So the, uh, the main children's hospital there. So it's a great, great hospital. And uh, Elizabeth Zinkula Yoder. Yoder? Yeah, Yoder. That's just my Facebook. I put Zinkula, so it's Elizabeth Yoder. So calm. Elizabeth Yoder. Okay. I just put last night. So in thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, we're going to talk about what you might have done differently. So go ahead, Matt. So, so I got one or two things. And, and uh, I don't know what Elizabeth is going to say because we've never met, but hopefully we, we pair up. But, you know, we talked about this and, and the goals of treatment. and. For whatever we do, I, I was asked to talk about conservative treatment, but alignment, motion, aesthetics, pain, those are all things we've, we've talked about. And, and interesting, when, when I showed this a little bit, but I think it speaks to what you were saying, is that some of the treatment challenges of what to do, we, we talked about how younger, smaller, more flexible patients respond well to therapy and bracing. And you say, well, if we can just get those, we can sort of treat this much, easy, much more easily. The problem is, unlike scoliosis, when you, when you have a little bit of a curvature, when you look at you straight ahead, that's abnormal. All of us have normal kyphosis, so the pediatricians and other people, they're sort of trained to see that kyphosis and think, oh, that's normal. And where it goes to abnormal at 50 degrees or 60 degrees, that's still a little bit of a gray area. And so I think that kids get diagnosed later as being abnormal and that means that they're older and they're stiffer and they're bigger curvatures which are all bad things for physical therapy and bracing to be effective so right off the bat we're at a position where you may come in and, and someone may say well you're not a candidate for therapy or bracing or that sort of thing and so I think that what we what we have to think about down the line is that surgery is certainly there but um, 
you can try some of these things knowing that they're sort of a backstop. And Abby talked about, you know, she didn't have any progression. And so uh, I think it's reasonable to say, you know, some of these things can be tried as long as we're all on the same page and knowing what the goal is. And if the goal is pain relief or deformity correction or what have you, we have to, we have to work together because it's not as cut and dry as it is with scoliosis. So with that, please, Elizabeth, tell us your story. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Yoder. I am right now living in the South Bend in the Indiana area. I'm from Des Moines, Iowa. And I was diagnosed when I was about 12 years old. The doctor came in and said, okay, it's Sherman's disease. It's not scoliosis. There is nothing we can do and left. And I'm pretty sure from what I've heard, lots of people have heard that. So I can't tell you how much curvature I had because my parents honestly don't remember because I, I had some back issues in high school about 25, I started having almost chronic daily back spasms. And everyone was like, you're low 20s, you should not be having back spasms. Uh, a little bit down the road, I went to this thing where this guy, this chiropractor was giving out free evaluations. He looks at my back, he's like, okay, do you have scoliosis? I'm like, no, Sherman's disease. He's like, let me guess, there's nothing they can do. I'm like, yes. He goes, well, they don't tell you that you're gonna get chronic back spasms if you don't get some sort of treatment. And I'm like, oh, I already have that. So beginning with that, when I was talking about what I wish I would have done, one was just research. Granted, back in 1995, there was no Google. If it was around, it just started. Because I think I read something somewhere that Buffy the Vampire Slayer just first show to use the term Google it. So yeah, there, really, that was what, late 1990s, early 2000s. There was no Google. There was no Facebook support groups. So if I had that opportunity to research, I would have researched. I also, once I started going to that chiropractor, which chiropractic work you have to find the right one there's a lot that are like they just you send you at the door and that's not good for Sherman's I've learned that the hard way but that was something my mom once I started going to that chiropractor and after six months he's like oh I wish I would have taken a before and after picture with you because my curve got so much better and I even have a picture from around that time on my phone where you can see how I'm like this sitting and not anymore and she was like I wish we would have done started having you go in high school so and then I, granted with Sherman's, everybody's different. That's a big key. But also finding, you know, chiropractic or a massage therapist, which also works for me, that knows about it. If you go to a massage therapist or a chiropractor or PT and they're like, I don't know what Sherman's disease is, don't go, because then they're not gonna help you. I've had times where I've left a massage therapist who didn't know about Sherman's and more pain than before I went in, kind of thing. Also, finding the right mattress. I know, um, I don't know if you see it, Doug gave me a, uh, the tuck, like foundations list, and my husband and I finally found a mattress where I can wake up and not have to roll out of bed in pain, which has been amazing. It's only been a couple weeks, but it's been so nice to get up in the day and want to do something and not want to just sit there because my back hurts so can much. Can you speak to that for just a moment? Because that's a common question that yes. probably many of us get in by our patients. What are the characteristics of the mattress? All right, so the one I have is the Nectar, is what we got. We were looking at, we wanted one that had more than a 120 day sleep trial, and this one is a 365 day and a lifetime warranty. And so that was our big thing, is we wanted something that we can use for a lot, not just three months and see how it goes. Um, I think this one is part memory foam, but my chiropractor who also knows Sherman's disease says, you want something that's firm on top, but soft on the bottom. And this one is like that. So that, like I said, it works for me. I can't guarantee it's gonna work for everyone. That's just, we were lucky that we found one that works. Um, my husband is ex-Amish, and my friend can testify, they want the best deal possible. And so when he went to an auction, when I was out of town, and it's like, oh, this is a pillow top, it's never been used, I'm gonna get this mattress. And that's where a lot of my troubles, things went downhill for me from there. I love him dearly, but it just did not work for me. Can I, can I interrupt you for yeah. you, you said something I think really important, and, and you talked about Dr. Sponseller, and um, when you said you went to the first person, they said, you know, you have kyphosis, there's nothing we can, we can do. I always tell my patients, you know, we're in this together. Um, and so can you talk, and maybe as you look back about what you wish you would have done, can you talk about the importance of you know, connecting with the physician, sort of being in it together and not taking a sort of rigid one word yeah. answer as, okay, there's nothing I can do and walking out the door. Yeah, uh, that's actually something my mom and I have talked about. And I think it's when you posted the study that was done in one of the cities is Iowa City. 
Des Moines is an hour and a half, two hours away from Iowa City. And I got diagnosed in 1995. So I texted my mom when you said that, and I was like, um, I said, okay, I go, yeah, when the doctor said there was nothing that could be done for my Shermans, he failed to mention there was a study going on in Iowa City at the time. So my mom's response is, oh, well, that was Dr. Brown, so I'm not surprised. So we found out down the line that he wasn't the best doctor. And so I think that I think, I think my mom would agree if I asked her right now is getting a second opinion, especially with this being so rare. And I think I was mentioned on the face group page, and I don't know if anyone remembers this, but I said something like, my grandma and I talk with Sherman's disease being rare, and she has myasthenia, which is rare too, that was like, we have to teach our doctors with these kind of things. And I feel like that's where I'm at, is wishing that we could be like, no, this is what we're going to do, and telling the doctor this is what it is, and finding, now knowing, at least knowing where I have specialists in Chicago and specialists in Indianapolis. I Find an so. advocate for you and yes. what your feelings are. And you know, second opinions shouldn't offend any physician. Yeah. You know, always yeah. encourage people to do that because some people, like anything, connect differently with different mm -hmm. people. And yep, I was young at the time. My parents were young at the time that we didn't know that it's okay to get a second opinion. And mm -hmm. now I know it's okay. Sure. <coughs> Good. Well, that's so far from all these sessions. Um, second opinions go online and be careful what you read online too as well. They have to vet what's what is there. Um, so we're gonna have now Doug Strott who's been through a lot himself. Um, I learned a little bit about Doug uh, this morning and we're gonna hear more now and Kimberly Best. Is Kimberly here? <laughs> She was six, so I'm not sure. Oh, she no, she didn't. Okay. She didn't. okay. So you want to sit there, Doug? Where do, wherever you want to be. Um, it's up to you. And then I think we're going to have plenty of time for discussion, so why don't you leave? Thank you. Um, do you have slides? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that, that folder top right. This one here, yeah. top right. There you there are. Let me go uh, to the slideshow. Those are nice. That's a nice color. Uh -huh. it's purple. Yeah. This one. This one. Yeah. 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 That goes right. This one. Do you want it? Do you mind? I'll do it. Thank you. Um, first of all, Doug, would you tell us uh, your organization and sure. uh, all that? Sure. Do we go to the second page? My pleasure. Awesome. There you go. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I am the founder of the Sherman's Disease Fund. Um, and the Sherman's Disease Fund is, is the only charity in the world to help those of us with Sherman's disease. I was diagnosed at the age of 17 with Sherman's disease. And <clears throat> first and foremost, I'm a patient. And I'm gonna, going to go through what I went through, the three stages of how the, the, this charity was formed. Um, now, my background is I have no, no history, no background in forming a charity. My, I used to be in the financial services industry, and I was with Dimensional Fund Advisors in Austin, Texas, when my back failed. So at, uh, before that, uh, when I was diagnosed, I was in a Milwaukee brace for, for about a year. It didn't do anything. So my doctor said, well, over the years, you may have some problems. Well, I ended up having a lot of problems. Um, at the age of 45, um, my back failed, and I had to have five fusion surgeries in three years. Then, uh, with that, they uh, they found out the hard way that I don't I don't fuse with cadaver bones, so they had to redo everything all over again. Uh, so I had to have, and Medtronic's out there, I have a Medtronic pain pump that goes directly intrathecal right into my spinal cord. Um, that helps a little. Um, but I was forced into retirement disability. Now, think about this. You're 45 years old. You have a long-term disability. Now what do you do with your life? Where do you go? I mean, I've been working since I was 12, 10, cutting, cutting lawns, cutting lawns, raking leaves. Now, what, what do I do? I mean, this is nobody, if you work for that long, 
It's, it is such, I can't tell you how depressing that is because I was not allowed to work part-time or full-time. Or full I couldn't do it. Um, now what do I do? Uh, you can change that. This is what I felt like. Okay. I didn't know anything about this disease. I didn't know anything of, of where I was going to go next and what, <laughs> where God was going to take me. I didn't have any idea. It still gets me checked a little choked up, so I, because it was very difficult. Uh, I can't tell you how much. My fiance Jen can, but it was only the two of us going through this. And uh, you can do the next page. I needed, at that time, I needed to understand what was going on with my body. I needed to understand what disease this was, how it was going to affect me, how, you know, what the possible consequences were of the surgeries, what my long-term outlook was. So I need to first and foremost be a student and learn about the disease. So see how the research began. So when the research began, it was no Dewey Decimal System anymore. You go online and you Google something, and what came up was nothing, zero. I couldn't find anything. There were a couple medical abstracts, but that's about it. So I decided to start a blog. I documented my experiences. I documented all the surgeries. I documented how badly I felt having to leave the community, the, and the social community, and, the, and the, um, my work community. So I continued to research and learn as a student. But eventually, people found me on the internet, which was very neat. So people started to find me, ask questions, ask more and more, and then I started to think, well, maybe I can now become an advocate, I, more so than a student. I'm learning as much as I can. Let me get this out to other people. I realized that there was a huge need for information. So, but how, this, how did this start for me becoming a charity? Well, my high school 35-year reunion was, was a few years ago. And I decided I'm not going. You know, Kane, you know, hunched, hunched over, still, still sore. So I was always an athlete. You know, here I am. You know, I looked like uh, Tim Conway. You know, <laughs> and I didn't go. So uh, my friend Sharon Skittle, at the end of the, the, the reunion, she said, "Listen, we have money left over here." From the reunion. We would like to take this money and give this to our friend, to a charity, to help my friend and our friend Doug Strzok. He has a bad spinal disease. We're going to take this check and give it to him. Does anybody object? Everybody clapped and it was beautiful. So they ended up giving me the money that was left over. How beautiful was that? I cried, I cried like a baby. It was beautiful. But the last problems, there was no charity. It was. There wasn't a charity that was solely dedicated to Sherman's disease. So I uh, sat down with Chrissy, the, now the vice president of our board, had breakfast and said, let's figure out what we're going to do. We decided what we're going to do for the charity, charity and all the causes. Improve uh, public recognition of this disease. That is foremost, the most important part. Excuse me. And we have to fight for early detection so nobody has to live through what I live through. The medical community to research, research and help them understand the potential impact of a long term quality of life. Because if this doesn't happen, if you don't get caught in early, early enough, this is going to happen. Long term quality of life is going to suffer. So we also decided what we are working to do now will not benefit me in any way. This is not for me. This is for the next generation and the next generation. We are setting this up because people need to know that before your bones are formed, you need to, have, needs to be determined if you have any spinal deformity. So, why is early detection so important? In adolescence, the person's bones are still pliable. That means it is the only time when a non-invasive treatment like bracing and exercise, are effective to correct uh, curvatures. It's the only time. So if we can catch people 
7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe 13, getting close 14. Those ages, and to figure out if they have any spinal deformity, including kyphosis and Sherman's disease, we can help them with a non-invasive um, form of exercise and bracing and correct the curvature. That's what we need to do. And that's our number one goal. Why? I'll give you why, the reason why. In 2019, 2015, the USPSTF, which is United States Preventative Services Task Force, told all school nurses out there in the country, do you know that it is no longer a national mandate that children get checked for any type of screening for, for uh, skeletal screening? In other words, no school does any skeletal screenings for children as no longer a national mandate. Remember, we all had that done. Bend over, touch your toes, check to see if there's any type of of uh, scoliosis, kyphosis uh, fell through the, uh, the cracks, but we're trying to change that. But that was why, this is a big reason why we, we go and we go after this. Doctors don't know this. Parents don't know this. So the parents think the doctors are doing the, the, the whole um, screening. Parents think the doctors, doctors think that the schools are doing it. Who is doing it? Who? No one. And, and if you should, if you show the next page, thank you, schoolosis.org. Here is the screening map. The gray, the gray schools or states have no re legislation mandating screening of children for, for skeletal, skeletal screening. The green states, they have legislation for school screenings. That's a lot of states and a lot of people. Now, it could be in there, but the governor or somebody could just say, no, we're not doing it. Those are the ones that have no mandate right now. By, by the way, sorry to interject. Oh. New York, the five boroughs of, Man of New York City excluded, even though New York has school screening and Rochester, because when the law was enacted, there were budgetary constraints. So mm -hmm. uh, a big portion of the population is not screened there, too. Mm -hmm. Think about that. And I would say, it says MD is one of the schools included, and I, I live in Maryland, and I've never had a single yeah, test or examination for that. Okay, do you think your doctors know? Well, no, his doctor know. has three. He's been to Vendover. You have yeah, that? I've never had so, yeah. Andrew, uh, no, nobody has have you been screened? See, that is where, that's where everybody's falling through the cracks. That is where we have to make sure that children are identified before adolescence. So then, going from a student to an advocate, this is what we did. For Sherman's Kyphosis, we created a comprehensive website. It is comprehensive. You, if there's any information you need, it's going to be there. And we're the only, we're the only, the only, uh, site, website, and organization that helps Sherman's disease patients and loved ones out there. We have the only website to help people. We help people. In old, we just set up our first little um, uh, uh, pre presentation in Kenya. So we have, we have our information out there all over the world. So we, have, we do information for Research Abstracts, the first international doctor database. What that is, is we have uh, patients call in and say, this doctor was great. Because the last 10 doctors had to pull out their, their phone and Google Sher Sherman's kyphosis. Has anybody had a doctor do that? Yeah. So what we did is we set up an doc international doctor database. I think we're now in like 20 countries. and we have doctors that patients refer to us, and they can go and see where, if they're looking for a doctor, they go there, and if there's a doctor there, they can use that doctor. So we are continually expanding that. We also have an aware, awareness room, which is uh, purple, as you can see. Um, we have pamphlets that have been de developed, as you can see at our table. We send out care packages to people all over the world. That includes pamphlets, that includes uh, T-shirts, that includes wristbands, and for no cost. 
We also have doctors that request these care factors as well. And I've given them to a number of doctors. It's really cool seeing them in the lobbies too. Uh, we, it's also, the care package is what we also want to do and why we send that out is that we want people to spread the word. Excuse me. Spreading the word is most important. Any way you can to tell people that this is not a benign disease. The secondary effects can, can be lethal. So we also worked with setting scoliosis straight to set up the first two long-term comprehensive research studies that have ever been done. We have the protocols and budgets done, we're just waiting for funding. And next. Now, how do you do this? How do you start all this? And again, this is just some of, my, some of the ideas that may help you. Maybe, maybe you want to figure out how to help others because uh, you, just because we're all in this, in this together. You can start your process as a student. Learn everything you can. Find everything out you can about this. There's, um, you can go to search engines, search Sherman's, there's medical research abstracts. There's a lot more on it now than when I looked at it. There are all the hospital explanations. They have detailed explanations of it. All of them are relatively different. Um, you can look for associated um, charitable organization websites that have definitions. Um, here are some other ideas. That being, going from a student to an advocate is important. Know the information before you go out there. there. Distribute their pamphlets to your doctors and ask if they be displayed in the lobby or used with patients. That's so successful. I'll give you an example. If you have, I, had, I had this call and I've had more than one calls. A, a guy called me and said, can you help me? My parents and friends laugh at me because they don't think Sherman's kyphosis, Sherman's disease, causes pain. And I'm in pain all day. What, are you, what am I supposed to do? I said, take this pamphlet, talk to them. If, they, if you have any problem, just get on, on, a, self, on a conference call and let's talk to them together. What he did is he took the pamphlet, discussed it with them, got on the website, and everything was fine. They understood that there was something, some, uh, there was some credibility behind this, and it was actually caused pain. So talking to young adults with this, and using these pamphlets with your parents, if they don't believe you, or your friends don't believe you, that can be effective. Um, we've had young adults use their bar mitzvah and bat mitzvah projects uh, for Shermans, which really helps in, their, in that society, but they also use it as projects to give us donations. We had the largest donation ever for a bat, for a bat mitzvah pro, um, project. <laughs> it was, yeah, she was wonderful. Um, it, was, it was really neat. Also, what we do is we talk to local schools about being involved in events, if we can help set up booths to the public, uh, help public rec recognition. We can set up a booth, with, uh, and we've done, we've done this at a chili cook-off. We've done this at uh, different games. Also, use the tees and wristbands that we give to you to promote active discussions. And you can uh, participate locally and in na or national in events such as Rare Disease Day or World Spine Day. Um, t-shirts are everywhere that you can get. We have t-shirts as well. Uh, and that's, that's all I have. I hope this was good. This is, just to give you an idea. So you've been through a lot. And you've uh, uh, given. You're giving back now, which is wonderful, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a few more minutes for uh, questions, answers, discussions of Doug. Uh, Joe O'Brien of the National Scoliosis Foundation is in the back of the room, who has his own personal experience and has been. A real advocate for patients with scoliosis and kyphosis too. So, I'd love to hear from anybody who has questions or comments. I just would like to explain that all of the training for screening in the schools includes kyphosis and low doses. So, if you don't specifically, I mean the, the the screening itself is from all dimensions, all planes. They're told to look for kyphosis. It is difficult to look at and determine whether or not it is just a general. Um, round of the back or whether or not it's kyphosis. They are actually trained to do a process where as the child is in an atom forward bedding test, to have them lift their head 
and you can see usually a flat back will go down, whereas a kyphosis will stay pretty uh, angular in there. So there is actually, that is part of the <coughs> test. They are trained for that, to do that. We did at one point have 27 states. We've been fighting for 40 years for early detection and treatment of, of uh, skeletal deformities, including kyphosis and lordosis, but primarily for AIS, because that represents the largest portion of kids within that age range. Um, so we promote early detection at all levels. Pediatricians and primary care is very difficult to do that, so we focus on the schools with large population-based screening. To get that <coughs> message out about the importance of early detection is so important because we have more evidence now that we can do something at an early stage. No matter what is going to be done, it's important to catch it at that stage. But please know it does include, you are not left out. My own daughter has, has kyphosis. Uh, we have three children with scoliosis and kyphosis, so uh, it has been very much a part of what the training is. Now, if they don't know it, refer them. They have a packet, and I can send a packet to all of you that explains it if you want to. As I said, we've been doing it for four years, so I commend you on what you're doing, and I, and I um, would love to do anything we can to help with that effort going through. You know, we're just, we're, uh, you've been very helpful. We've asked for information okay. uh, from your, your organization. It's very, very helpful. Seems like a good merger of uh, organizers. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's being, just having a support group is just wanted to say is so important uh, for a child, uh, regardless of the age. Um, a positive support, support group makes some, such a difference. Uh, yes? Hey, Doug, I just want to say my husband's in the um, state legislature, mm -hmm. and so I didn't realize it wasn't in Maryland, so we were going to be on that. <laughs> Excellent. Nice. Let me know if there's anything we can do. Yeah. More than happy to, to send letters. Peter, did you have a question or no? Okay. Thank you. That's that's helpful. Uh, anything else? I think everybody's hungry, maybe for lunch. <laughs> okay, so. yeah, Unfortunately, awesome. I'm going to have to take off and head back to New York, so I won't be at lunch. But it's uh, been great having everybody here and your participation and sharing your experiences. And uh, let's all go forward and do our best and and work on that school's early detection component of this and options. Look at, uh, look at your options and get a second opinion. Yes. You too, Abigail. And check out our doctor database. I can give you a first doctor to go to. Yeah. Great.